Greenwood Cemetery was founded in 1880, and across the 82 acres are buried some of Orlando's most prominent citizens. It was the first and oldest cemetery in Orlando, so you know it's not a surprise that there are lots of ghost stories and that this is one of the most haunted locations in Orlando with people seeing floating apparitions, hearing laughing, hearing music, even odd smells if you stand in the right spot. Being that Greenwood Cemetery is Orlando's first real burial site, many of the area's most prominent residents are buried here. The graves of business people, politicians, historical figures, and media moguls can all be found at Greenwood. Many of the city's mayors are buried here as well. Edna Fuller, the first woman to serve in the Florida legislature, Harry Lou, who founded Lou Gardens, Joseph Bumby and the Bumby family for who Bumby Avenue is named, Dairy Company founder T.G. Lee, and Baseball Hall of Famer Joe Tinker, for whom Tinker Field was named, are all buried here. Come with me as we take a haunting and historical tour of this amazing cemetery. Greenwood Cemetery has three segregated portions to it. Uh, of course, you know, at that time, uh, especially in the South, there were designated areas where blacks could be buried, where whites could be buried, and Greenwood was no different. These sections used to be in the very back of the cemetery. Now that the entrance has changed, they are located at the very front. They are some of the oldest parts of the cemetery. And uh, it was segregated up until 1967 when it was found that the cemetery was violating the Civil Rights Act. So the city of Orlando quickly changed that and no longer made it mandatory that there were segregated areas to the cemetery. When Florida became a state in 1845, almost half its population were enslaved African Americans. After the Civil War, newly emancipated men and women came to this area in search of land of their own and employment in the growing community. By the time Greenwood Cemetery was founded in 1880, more African Americans called Orlando home, and a number gained prominence and success despite restrictive barriers. Gus Henderson was a respected African American resident of Central Florida who published the Winter Park Advocate and later the Florida Christian Recorder. He was instrumental in incorporating Hannibal Square, an African American subdivision of residential homes and businesses, into the city of Winter Park. Henderson worked tirelessly to improve black voter registration in Central Florida. His political activism shaped Winter Park, and his work has continued to inspire civil rights advocates to this day. One of the most popular stories at Greenwood Cemetery is that of a land deal gone wrong and the eternal revenge of Fred Weeks. It's also reported to be one of the most haunted spots in the cemetery. Fred Weeks was a northern businessman arriving in the area to buy land near the cemetery as an investment property. Upon his arrival, he realized that the land was nothing but a worthless swamp. He was furious, having been ripped off by the three English attorneys who had sold him the land. He attempted to get his money back, but to no avail. Seeking revenge, Weeks then bought another plot of land at the entrance of Greenwood Cemetery and erected a tombstone inscribed with the men's names. The tombstone was also inscribed with a biblical verse from Luke 10.30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Clearly this was directed at the men and their thieving ways. The placement at the front of the cemetery was obvious. He wanted everyone visiting Greenwood to be aware of their dubious character. The three Englishmen promptly bought the land back and removed the tombstone. Fred never let go of the incident, though. Around 1910, Weeks then bought another piece of land in the cemetery about 100 feet away from the original tombstone. Weeks built his mausoleum on this land and once again inscribed the verse from Luke 10.30. Under the verse is a small square, large enough to fit the names of the three men. Some say the names were chiseled off by the families of the men. Others say that Weeks had been threatened with lawsuits and was forced to remove the names. No one knows for sure, but we do know that this is the final resting place for Fred Weeks. Many still see the ghost of Fred Weeks, usually standing in front of the mausoleum, or not too far from it. It could be that the scam still has Fred turning in his grave. As racial tensions rose across the United States before the 1920 presidential election, white supremacists tried to stop African-American voters from voting in Ocoee, which is a town near Orlando. And it's also the site of one of the worst locations of racial violence in recent history. An African-American resident, Julie Perry, fought against this through a voter registration drive. 
On election day, a prosperous African-American farmer attempted to vote, but was turned away twice, along with other members of Ocoee's black community. A white mob chased him to the home of Julie Perry, who drove away the mob when he shot and killed two of the men in front of his home. The mob called for reinforcements and began torching churches, businesses, and other establishments in the black community. About 30 to 35 African-American people were killed in the ensuing violence. Julie Perry was murdered and publicly lynched as a message to scare Ocoee's African-American community. Afterwards, hundreds of people fled Ocoee, essentially making it an all-white town. Along with Julie Perry, other victims of lynchings in and around Orlando are buried here at Greenwood. William Boone was a veteran of two world wars and a lifelong educator who served as Orlando High School's last principal. Boone primarily taught biology and science during his career and was a popular and successful basketball coach. In 1932, he became the principal of Orlando High School. William R. Boone High School was named in his honor. Communities have always struggled with how to care for the less fortunate, and Orlando is no different. So Greenwood Cemetery has a section set aside to care for those who have no means of their own, here in Section Q. Tucked away in the far back corner of the original cemetery layout, this section houses those whose society neglected, sometimes called a pauper burial ground, potter's field, or even a stranger's row. This section contains the unmarked graves of those who lived and died in Orlando, but whose individual stories are lost to us. Many people from the infamous Sunland Hospital are buried in this section. Once a place for patients of tuberculosis and later a behavioral center for mentally challenged youth, it was closed in 1985 after a lawsuit alleged abuse and neglect at the facility. Over 47% of Sunland patients buried in Section Q died before their sixth birthday. We'll talk more about that when we reach the haunted babyland section of the cemetery. In the early years of Orlando, two major fires defined the growth and the progress towards modernization for the city. The first of these fires in 1884 burned four buildings at a time when Orlando was only a square mile. Another fire in 1891 destroyed a great portion of Greenwood Cemetery, including nearly all of the wooden headboards. This prompted the cemetery's purchase by the city as well as subsequent fire code changes. Most grave markers before the fire were made of cypress wood. Granite and marble headstones were too expensive before the railroads and mass market catalog companies made them affordable for Orlandians. The fire destroyed all but two of the original Cypress wood markers. The Confederate Soldiers Monument, which now stands at Greenwood Cemetery in Section J, was originally erected in front of the Orange County Courthouse in 1911 by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The monument itself features a six-foot-tall soldier atop a 30-foot pedestal. Johnny Reb, as he has come to be known by locals, is captured mid-stride, carrying his rifle on his shoulder. The monument's pedestal is encircled by the inscriptions dedicated to the lost cause for which it stands. It was moved in 1917 to Lake Eola and remained there for a century until it was moved to Greenwood Cemetery as part of a national campaign to remove or relocate statues and monuments honoring the Confederacy from public parks. William Henry Jewell was a northern-born Confederate soldier and lawyer. Jewell served as Orlando's 19th mayor. It was during Mayor Jewell's tenure that the city of Orlando pursued its beautification campaign, constructing sidewalls, planting trees and flowers, and adopting a new city motto, the City Beautiful. While in office, Mayor Jewell also became the first mayor to violate a city ordinance while in office when he hitched his horse to an awning post of a downtown business in 1908. He was arrested and subsequently served as both defendant and presiding judge in the mayor's court, where he fined himself $5, with $4 of the fine being suspended. Mayor Jewell paid his $1 fine, equivalent to about $33 today, and was released by the city marshal. From 1861 to 1865, as the nation divided over slavery and engaged in bloody civil war, more than 2.6 million men pledged their loyalty to the Union 
by enlisting in the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marines. Among these were 200,000 African-American men, many previously enslaved, who had been authorized by the Emancipation Proclamation to form U.S. colored troops and defend their newfound freedom. After the war, these black and white Union veterans sought to recreate the camaraderie of their units while preserving the memory of their patriotic sacrifice through the formation of the civic groups and fraternal orders. The Grand Army of the Republic, GAR, was founded on April 6, 1866 as a fraternal organization for Union veterans of the Civil War. Orlando's GAR, U.S. Grant Post 10, was formed in 1886. Nearly 100 grave sites are enclosed within the GAR section of Greenwood Cemetery with markers honoring veterans and family members buried there. Visitors to the cemetery do make mention of apparitions clad in military garb wandering around the cemetery, only to disappear when they're spotted. Joseph Bumby was born in 1843 in Essex, England. Bumby settled his family on a 160-acre homestead plot in Orlando acquired for a $4 filing fee. A log and frame building was erected on the property, an orange grove planted, and a warehouse constructed on the corner where the Bumbies sold hay, grain, and fertilizer. While their orange trees grew, Bumby carried the mail from Orlando to Mellonville on horseback. This route eventually landed him a contract to carry passengers and freight in horse-drawn wagons, a 12-hour round trip that was Central Florida's first public transportation nicknamed Bumby's Express. His success enabled him to build a large, beautiful colonial-style home on Bumby Street. In 1886, the Joseph Bumby Hardware Company building was constructed. Many of Orlando's residents used materials purchased from Bumby's hardware store in the construction of the city. Francis Epps, the grandson of President Thomas Jefferson, was a cotton farmer, slave owner, and civic leader that had a lot to do with the rise of Tallahassee during his tenure as mayor. After the Civil War, he moved to Orlando, established a citrus farm, and played a pivotal role in establishing the Cathedral Church of St. Luke. The church originated in his home with pioneer settlers gathering there for morning and evening prayer. Today, a stained glass window in the church honors his memory. In 2004, the city of Orlando and the Florida Department of State erected a two-sided historical marker at the gravesite, highlighting the Epps Shine family's connections to Thomas Jefferson and their local contributions as civic and business leaders. In 1913, Ezra Sperry donated land and money to the city of Orlando to develop a public park at Lake Eola that he hoped would be put under his name with this beautiful fountain as its centerpiece. Well, the city was not too keen on changing the name of Lake Eola to his name, but they gladly took the land anyway. Sperry's generosity so endeared him to the public that he was persuaded to run for mayor. Mayor Sperry was the co-founder and owner of the South Florida Foundry and Machine Works, which makes the wrought iron fountain and bears his name. The Sperry Fountain was considered to be the first public art piece in the city of Orlando. The Sperry Fountain remained the only fountain at Lake Eola Park until 1957, when the Centennial Fountain was installed. The original was moved to Greenwood Cemetery in 2017, with the swan topper facing the man who was instrumental in the fountain's creation, Mayor Ezra Frank Sperry. Second Lieutenant Marion Phillips of Orlando served with distinction in the Army Nurse Corps in World War II before her untimely demise in February of 1945. As a track and field athlete, she broke three collegiate records, high jump, standing broad jump, and record for the basketball throw. Phillips served as the president of the Florida State College for Women's Athletic Association from 1931 to 32, and was one of the select few women at the college to be given the coveted rank of wearer of the emblem, the highest athletic honor awarded at the college. In June 1942, shortly after the United States entered World War II, Phillips joined the Army Nurse Corps and was sent overseas that October as a second lieutenant. She served with distinction in the Allied North African and Italian campaigns at the 114th Station Hospital. Phillips and her unit were awarded a multitude of commendations, including the American Campaign Medal, the Nurse Corps Badge, and the European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal. Initially buried in Italy, Phillips' remains were returned to the United States in 1949 and reinterred in the American Legion plot of the Greenwood Cemetery. One of the creepiest sections of Greenwood Cemetery is Babyland, and it's exactly what it sounds like. This is where all the children under the age of five were buried, and there are three Babyland sections in Greenwood. 
Many of these children died in the infamous Sunland Hospital, once a place for patients of tuberculosis and later a behavioral center for the mentally challenged youth. Due to horrific allegations of abuse and neglect, Sunland was shut down sometime in the 1980s. Many of the children who passed here ended up buried at Babyland. Sunland, now abandoned, is itself a haunted location and one of the most infamous in Central Florida. Being that many of Sunland's patients were buried at Greenwood, the connection between the two make for a creepy concoction of ghost stories. Many of these children were still infants, and a disturbingly high percentage of them had died on the same day they were born. Their tombstones often don't have a name and only have one date, the day of their birth and death. Many visitors to the cemetery report hauntings in and around Babyland, most notably around Babyland 1 and 3. Visitors report hearing the sound of children laughing and playing, or the melodies of a child's music box. Some even say that they'll feel strange sensations, like a tug on their pants, similar to the way a child would try to gain the attention of an adult. Samuel Austin Robinson was a representative in the state legislature for two terms, alderman, city surveyor, Orange County tax collector, and trustee of the Orlando Public Schools. He also designed the Greenwood Cemetery. His design, quite unlike Southern American cemeteries of the time, was pronounced to be one of the best original designs. And his headstone is very original as well, as you can see. Designing the cemetery around the trees and hills of the area, Robinson gave Greenwood Cemetery its unique circular grid. The Wilmot family was an influential Orlando family around the turn of the 19th century. They mostly dealt in real estate, and even to this day, there are some neighborhoods named after the Wilmots. Their mausoleum is positioned on the highest point of the Greenwood Cemetery and is the only other mausoleum besides the Weeks Mausoleum. Despite being a well-to-do family, the Wilmots weren't without tragedy. The Wilmot family lost their grandson, Fred Wilmot Jr., and a family friend, Frank Pounds Jr., when they both drowned at a swimming hole. Both children were only five years old and had misjudged the depth of the water, leading to them wading in too deep. Freddie Jr. and his family are all buried at the mausoleum. There are reports of a ghost appearing at the Wilmot Mausoleum, usually at the entrance. Visitors usually report seeing the same thing, a male figure in an old-fashioned military uniform looking off into the distance. It's not known whether or not this soldier is related to the Wilmot family at all. There you go. That is a look at the Greenwood Cemetery, Orlando's first cemetery, and one of the most haunted spots in Orlando. If you check out their website, they do occasionally do moonlight tours, but they fill up very, very quickly, and you'll learn about all the haunting stories and things like that. But if you are in the Central Florida area and you are into history and uh, you know you want to see an amazing place that uh, you know was was the first of something in Orlando, come to Greenwood Cemetery. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you have, click that like button to let the powers that be know that you like the video. And while you're at it, click on follow or subscribe and you'll be notified when I upload new videos. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.